War Pugs. So today we're going to be checking out something, and this is, looks like it's a video essay on tropes, uh, particularly the space horror trope. This is from Overly Sarcastic Productions, and this is requested by Apes Death by Lasers um, in the Discord. Now, the last time I checked out anything from Overly Sarcastic Productions, it was a good long while ago, but probably about a year or so ago, and they were talking about basically the Grimdark. I agreed with some things. I didn't disagree. Like, I, I agree with some things. I didn't agree with other things. Which is the way that, you know, I... That this kind of talk, discussion that she was having, I think deserves to go. But, um, I really did enjoy it. And I'm glad to see you guys have asked for more from Overly Sarcastic uh, to be, you know, on the channel. Now... The opening scroll of this. This video contains copious amounts of space nightmare fuel. Space nightmare fuel is the stuff that I live for. Um, mostly. Mostly. But uh, space horror is a whole different genre when it comes to horror. I love aliens. I love Event Horizon. I love all of it because... The one thing you can say about space horror, you can pretty much come up with anything. You can make anything work. Um, my fav like, space has become my absolute fascination as far as any kind of series that I want to watch. If you put, if you put, oh, by the way, it's in space in there, I'm automatically 50% more inclined to watch it. So you could literally say, hey, it's the Muppets. Muppets in space. I'm watching that. I'm just saying. So... We're gonna we're gonna sit on back, listen to what she says about the like space horror trope, and like with last time I checked out something from her. If I agree, I'll let you guys know. If I don't, same thing. Let's get into it. Warning: In this video, I give you a lot of reasons to be scared of space. Yay! If you are already scared of space. This might not be the video for you. If you aren't scared of space, this video might change that. This. Fully didn't occur to me when I scripted it because I love space, but Blue told me we needed a content warning, which is a pretty good sign that we definitely needed a content warning. So, if you feel that strongly about it, then, like, there's been times I've been writing a script and I've been like sitting there just looking at it, like, oh boy, I might want to have a little disclaimer before. Be warned: this video about how space is scary might convince you that space is scary. Yes. Let's go. Fuck. Experts around the world agree that humans look up sometimes. In fact, looking up is one of our species' favorite hobbies, and it's been highly popular for as long as we've had suitably flexible spines and apex predators that know how to climb. But up is more than just a fun direction tigers sometimes come out of. Up is also where space is. Space is I didn't think there was any fun directions that tigers came out of. I'm just saying. I, I mean, I'm not really saying anything, but have you ever seen a tiger come towards you where there was not like a thick fence or glass wall between you and them that you actually considered it fun. This is why I don't screw around in India or anywhere else there are tigers. Or in Texas where Mike Tyson has several tigers. It's also in every other direction, but you can forgive an early human for not guessing that. And space is very exciting from a world-building standpoint. Our built-in sleep schedule aligns with the day-night cycle defined by the sun rising and setting every basically 24 hours, so the sky is kind of foundational to some pretty important human stuff. The sun definitely commands the most attention on a day-to-day -day basis, but the night sky presents intrigue and mystery. A nearly static pattern of sparkling lights that ever so slightly shifts every night, but the pattern of the stars always matches the season and changes at the same constant rate as the year's weather patterns. Mm -hmm. The sky always Always looks the same when it's cold and it always looks the same when it's hot and it always looks the same when the flowers come back clearly it has to mean something what are those lights are they the campfires of our ancestors chariots of the gods memorials to long dead heroes and monsters why do some of them move around sometimes that's not even touching on the moon good grief how do we get anything done around here there's so many questions of course questions beget investigation and investigation eventually produces answers True. the stars change at the same rate as the early seasons because they're affected by the same thing the earth's position relative to the sun. As the Earth orbits the sun, our axial tilt exposes us to a fluctuating amount of sunlight while also pointing us at different sections of the sky every night. Those extra bright wandering stars were actually other planets that also orbited the sun. Though there was, of course, some debate over this as the idea that the known universe orbited the sun instead of the Earth called into question the seemingly ironclad thesis that the Earth was the de facto center of the universe and the most important thing around. I 
there were actually several people that were excommunicated from the church for postulating that the earth might not be the center of the universe. This happened. This was a thing. And it's really not surprising when you consider how dogmatically opposed like many religious fun- many many religions were to this. There are some people believe the earth is flat. Even today. God help us all. I mean, it had to be. It's where we live. This position got less and less defensible as it became clear that the stars were not sparkly mica chips adorning the inside of a massive sphere with us at the center, but in fact, more suns, just as big and sometimes bigger than our own shiny number and incomprehensibly far away. With each new revelation, the known universe got more and more vast, and Earth's place in that universe started to look a lot less centralized and a lot more teeny-weeny. But this was also exciting. If space was a place rather than a pretty skybox or a crystal sphere or something, then we could go there. We could explore. That is so cool that she got that in there right there. <coughs> the, Hub- the Hubble Deep Sky, Sky Study composite mosaic of 7,500 7, plus galaxies, 2009, and this, this part of the sky is about a third of the diameter of the full moon. That's actually kind of terrifying. And who knew what we would find? Maybe more people just like us, or exciting hostile worlds to explore, ray gun in hand. If every star was a sun, who knew how many Earths could be out there? Who else had been out there? What had they seen? What had they built? Why hadn't they called us? But as the picture got clearer, it became increasingly obvious that space wasn't a thriving ecosystem of exciting aliens, humanoid or otherwise. It was airless, irradiated, and most dishearteningly, everything was really, really far away. Far from hopping in your high-tech personal spaceship with your bubble helmet and form-fitting spacesuit and jetting off to Mars to hang out with their exotic Martian queen, space travel was slow, claustrophobic, physically and mentally taxing, and unrewarding. Space was quiet. Everywhere that looked exciting was much too far away to reach in a human lifetime, or even ten human lifetimes. I'm always a fan of the Dark Forest hypothesis. If you don't know what that is... Ugh. It's the answer to the Fermi Paradox that is actually... Absolutely terrifying. The things that made them exciting usually also made them incredibly hostile to human survival. And not just hostile, incomprehensible. There were things in space that were so much bigger than the entire planet Earth that the laws of physics that affected them were things we'd never seen before because they don't happen on the scale we experience anywhere on this planet. Black holes, where the gravity is so strong that their escape velocity is higher than the speed of light, had been theorized to exist since people first figured out that there was a speed of light, but guessing they existed was not the same thing as seeing the damn things bending space-time around them. And the concept of radiation only really started to be understood in, like, 1900, which is pretty rough considering stars are radioactive nuclear furnaces and we were trying to get all up close and personal with them and we'd barely just figured out that they could turn our DNA inside out. We started to realize that space was so enormously vast and so far outside the scale of anything we were familiar with that we could barely understand what we were dealing with out there. And a lot of what we were dealing with was turning out to be startlingly good at killing us. It was impossibly enormous, terrifyingly deadly, and eerily silent. Sci-fi writers busily got started on imagining warp drives and hyperspace and stargates that'll let their fictional space explorers bypass that tedious speed of light thing and actually get somewhere before dying of old age. But on the flip side, a new trend began to emerge in fiction. Space was really, really creepy. Not just creepy, existentially disturbing. It hit that perfect balance of claustrophobia and agoraphobia. Space is so deadly that you can only survive in a shielded, pressurized, terrifyingly fragile vessel, usually cramped and disorienting. Mm -hmm. And outside that vessel is millions of miles of nothing, and the nothing really wants you dead. Space, the final frontier, was absolutely terrifying. Now, for all the reasons we've just discussed, space makes a great horror setting. In fact, it's almost too good at being a horror setting because it's scary on almost every possible level. So when it... First off, no gravity, so the number one thing that you wake up with every single day and have experienced all of your life, throughout all recorded memory, is gone. Number two, exactly the thing that she was just talking about, no one will hear you scream because there's no air. Number three, nightmare fuel upon nightmare fuel upon nightmare fuel upon nightmare fuel when you start thinking about just how much space is in between objects just on a stellar range just 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 on a planetary range much less you know system to system or anything of that nature it takes 
at the speed of light eight minutes for light to get from the sun to us. If somebody were to go to Mars, it takes 20 minutes to get a signal to Mars and then back. That is so unbelievably mess with your head worthy about how much space you're talking about there. Ah. It gets used for horror, the writer usually needs to narrow down what specific facet of space they'll be exploring for horror. One of the earliest popular subgenres of space horror was the alien invasion. This was a common anxiety in early sci-fi that has since lost popularity somewhat. Structurally, it was very simple. Space was really big, full of other stars and planets, potentially just like ours. We were alive, and historically known to indulge in the odd bout of being colonizing bastards, so it was reasonable to speculate that somewhere out there in the vast cosmos, there could be other colonizing bastards with better guns. These stories gave audience is an easy bad guy to unconditionally hate. A horde of incomprehensible alien creatures descending from the previously inoffensive heavens to give us the old British Navy special for their own nefarious purposes. Early alien invasion stories usually featured aliens as a terrifyingly superior foe to be fought in total war, but later stories featured more subtle invasions by things like body snatchers or mm -hmm. pod people who could replace your neighbors with you being none the wiser. And and then you have the crab people. Ever so coincidentally, this happened to be happening at the same time as the Red Scare. Because it's kind of awkward when the scary evil aliens are just doing what we did more efficiently, but it's okay when the scary evil aliens are doing what those jerks over there did. Still, the cut and dry alien invasion story found itself being subverted more and more. Some stories instead painted the alien invader as more of a first contact situation that humans royally beef by being all paranoid and tribal about it, suggesting yeah. that the reason space seems so quiet is because all the cool aliens think we're jerks. In other stories, the invasion is less of a coordinated attack force and more of a single threat, like a single very dangerous alien or something like a space plague or a really weird meteor. In simple cases, these things just kill people, but in more Lovecraftian stories, they might be something from so far outside our world's paradigm that just by its nature, it does completely incomprehensible stuff to the people and things around it. And by the time anyone figures out what it's doing, it's already been doing it. This creeping dread in an alien corruption is more popular nowadays than the invading alien army approach, but they all kind of embody the same general principle. Something alive comes from space and it's a wait a minute what the world was that that she had up here the same general principle it's a big pile of alpacas fused together by mysterious colors unlike any scene on earth couldn't decide if it needed censoring better safe than sorry Always a good idea. Something alive comes from space, and it's a problem. But alien invasion stories almost always happen on Earth. Otherwise, they wouldn't really be invasions. In stories set in space, the horror focus will often draw on environmental isolation. As The big thing about space, like the invasion storyline, as far as things go, there was only w one movie where I saw the movie and... For the first little bit, I was really, really happy with what I was seeing. Because if... Uh, let's just throw out the idea that Earth were invaded by a species that came from outside of our solar systems. Well, um, if it comes from outside the solar system, we're hosed 100% of the time. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We are absolutely, unequivocally, just 100% hosed, okay? There is no, we're going to be fine. There is no computer virus to save us. There is no nothing like that. We are hosed. Absolutely hosed. And the reason behind that is, we... We make such a big... I talked to somebody about this the other day. We make such a big deal out of the splitting of the atom. We make such a monumental deal out of the nuke. When... I mean, a dude thought at one point, my club has a spike on it, therefore I'm the most lethal thing ever to exist. That happened. I mean... The nuke could be so primitive. Now, it could be so unrelentingly primitive. A species looks at that and is just like, that's absolutely adorable. Let me show you what we have and then proceeds to blow the moon in half. I mean, let's just let's just be real here. I mean, 
Invasion storylines, 100% of the time, 100% of the time, will irritate me at some point unless I literally just turn off the part of my brain that says this is BS. I just have to turn off the part of my brain that says this is BS. There's no way. Um, if a species is able to travel to here from outside the solar system, they're already so far ahead of us that we are 100% a joke in terms of military power to them. Like, my one of my favorite ones to ever watch from a standpoint of, until they screwed it up, until they screwed it up, was uh, Skyline. Because the first part of that movie is just constant. It's just a constant beat down. Like, there is, like, there is no chance. We can't even look at the ships because we'll get, we'll just, we'll just be taken over. They're just literally vacuuming people up from the street. Why? I don't know. But when I, I say that Skyline was my favorite horror movie up until about the hour mark into that movie when they revealed while they were taking human prisoners. When that happened, it literally became the dumbest movie ever to exist, bar none, on any planet, in any universe, and I regret ever enjoying it in the first place. Another one is Battle Los Angeles. I had to turn my brain off for Battle Los Angeles. Okay, they're launching in Meteors OS ODST style, and the best they have is infantry tactics that are very similar to our own with weapons that are more or less inferior in some ways than our own. Just shoot me. Let's go. As discussed, being in space is claustrophobic and agoraphobic all at once. Yes. Most horror stories involve a character being trapped and isolated in a bad situation, hence explaining why they don't just call for help or run away from the monster. And space horror takes that to its logical conclusion. Why don't they run? Because there's nowhere to go. Why don't they call for help? Because there's nobody around for millions of miles. And while they're dealing with the scary space monster, they better hope the ship doesn't get damaged too badly because that tiny bubble of habitable space is very fragile, and once the air gets out of it, it's a lot more difficult to put it back in. While yeah. horror stories set on Earth often end with the cops showing up or the cavalry arriving to rescue the surviving protagonists, horror stories in space can be rather more unforgiving. Sometimes the space police show up to help, but sometimes the best the characters can hope for is putting themselves into cryosleep and hoping someone hears their distress call before they drift into the sun. Space is pretty close to the bottom of the list of places I'd want to try fighting a monster. The archetypical example of this is obviously Alien, where the hero is stuck playing cat and mouse with the unholy offspring of a gimp suit and a velociraptor, and her job would be a lot easier if she wasn't stuck with it with nowhere to go. But back closer to home, we find an odd cousin of the space horror genre that combines it with the Save the World plotline to form something really big is falling towards the planet. This might Greenland, probably one of the better versions of this in the past 30 years. It sound oddly specific and look a little less like space horror, but it draws from similar anxieties as the alien invasion. Space True. is very, very big, and we know there's a lot of stuff out there in it. It can just be hard to get to that stuff. In fact, we know from our own fossil record that stuff from space has hit the Earth before, and in one noteworthy case, did a pretty good job of wiping out all life on Earth. Well, 75%. Still not bad for a giant rock. So space True. is really big, and it's full of other really big stuff, some of it moving very fast. It's yes. reasonable to worry that some of that really big stuff might hit us someday. NASA certainly thinks so, as they keep a very careful watch on all the big near-Earth objects that would potentially be a problem if their orbit ever got too cozy with ours. Now, now here's the thing with that. The, the, be the best fun time part of that is the Torrid Meteor Stream. And if you guys are ever outside in October... Just look up. You're bound to see something. That's the... You're bound to see something. Now, before I give anyone nightmares, this is the kind of problem that NASA spends a lot of time and energy and money focusing on so they oh, can yeah. keep it from becoming a problem. And it is not a problem any of us regular Johnnies need to lie awake at night stressing over. Okay? Do not stress about the fact that every few seconds something enters our atmosphere that is the size of a bowling ball or, or less than that. Do not stress over the fact that every couple of, you know, hundred years something enters the size of a car... Definitely don't stress about the fact that every hundred or so years something the size of a football stadium comes out of the sky. Just don't worry about it. Okay, cool. But in fiction, giant scary space rocks are a thrilling and or melancholic action-driving plot device. The horror yes. of this story format comes from space and draws on some major stars of the space horror tropes. Incomprehensible vastness, a sense of powerlessness in the face of the void. But rather than playing these up for active horror, these stories tend to be more melancholy or action-y than standard space horror. In melancholic settings, the story might be more about how the characters cope with the seemingly inevitable destruction of the world, while in action-y settings, they usually have to go blow up or otherwise defeat the giant space rock 
dialogue before it gets any ideas on upstaging the moon. Yep. Next up, back in actual space, we get stories of the format We Found Something Really Weird. A constant Aliens. danger of exploration is the risk of finding stuff we don't understand that turns out to be much more dangerous than we're prepared for, or that has weird and scary effects we don't know. I said aliens and I didn't even look at the illustration. Aliens. How to deal with creepy artifacts with bad vibe auras, things that turn out to be part of alien reproductive cycles, an ancient space ruin that's totally silent but not as empty as it looks, etc. etc. These things often kick off horror plots by being actively very bad to be around, but they have varying degrees of individual malevolence. Think the spectrum of cursed artifacts. Some of them are actively hostile, some are just passively radioactive, some aren't actually all that bad, they just kick off the inciting incident. This variant is very popular in video games, probably yes. because it's a really good premise for interesting environment design, collectible MacGuffins, and enemies for the protagonists to shoot en masse. And just one half step away from that is, turns out space itself is really weird. As astronomy and space exploration has been a constant process of learning new, increasingly unsettling information about what space is and how it works, this sentiment is grounded in the very real experience of studying the cosmos as a whole. Turns out stars aren't just points of light, they're suns, just really far away ones. Except for these stars, which are actually planets. And this one, which is actually a whole galaxy full of hundreds of billions of stars. And these two, which are actually the same galaxy, but there's a very strong source of gravity between us and it, like a black hole, and the gravitational lensing is causing the galaxy's image to be distorted from our perspective because that's a thing that can happen. Oh. Uh. What's a black hole? Glad you asked. See, they used to- That. That be called dark stars when they were theorized in 1784, but actually they're just objects with such strong gravity that not even light can escape them, and they also might have collapsed into a zero-dimensional singularity that has functionally no physical properties other than their mass, charge, and angular momentum. So how do we know they're even there? Well, by how much they fuck up everything around them, of course. See, with real stuff this unnerving, it's no wonder that fiction ratchets it back and just makes it so space is hell or something. Considering that the history of space discovery has been one deeply unsettling discovery after another, it's fully reasonable for a writer to speculate that launching ourselves into space willy-nilly might result in finding some more new and exciting things we don't understand that can warp us or kill us in new and fascinating ways and the concept of a black hole is just it's, it is so screwed in the head terrifying like you the amount of pressure the amount of gravity that that has is absolutely mind-numbing on any level that you could possibly conceive, it is mind-numbing how much pressure is in a black hole. It There is so much gravity. The reason that warping happens is because not even light can escape it. That is absurd. That is absolutely absurd. Do you realize, like, what you would have to compress... Like, take something like Freedom Tower. Do you realize what you would have to compress that down to in order to form the same kind of, of density that you would find in a black hole? If you could some... I don't know any way or shape or form to even begin to bring this up and how maddening this is. A black hole the size of a baseball... A black hole the size of a baseball could ruin this entire solar system, and we never see it coming. All of a sudden, one day, we just realize how screwed we were. And it's just as reasonable for them to speculate that space itself might be in some way warped and kill happy. It's quite common for writers to specifically explore this concept in the context of wormholes, warp drives, hyperspace, and all the other bits of sci-fi spec fic designed to circumvent certain inflexible physical laws to enable happy fun time space adventures without that killjoy speed of light getting in the way. The idea th Best movie, best horror movie ever made, 100% is Event Horizon. That is that. If you've never seen Event Horizon, it comes with my highest recommendation, period. It's actually, if you're a fan of 40K, it can technically be considered a prequel to 40K. You could really consider it that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch it, you'll understand. If you do what I'm talking about, you understand. 
in that bypassing a fundamental law of reality might have some, to use the technical term, fucky consequences is pretty popular. Even in settings where it isn't exactly space, it's common for any kind of trans-dimensional gateway network or spooky zero-gravity hell dimension to be at least kind of deeply unnerving to deal with. In stories like this, passing through a wormhole or switching on a warp drive for the first time can come with some very unpleasant unintended consequences. I.e. demons. This can be comparatively tame, like in Larry Niven's version of hyperspace travel, where the space outside the ship in transit is complete blank nothingness, like the observer's blind spot is covering the window at all times, and it's really creepy. And it can also be blindingly unsubtle, like in Event Horizon, where opening a wormhole turned out to literally transport the ship to physical, actual hell. At which point it very considerately brought some hell back to share with the class. This because sharing is caring, okay? Sharing is caring can even work in stories with only space-like settings, like Reboot, which is set entirely in a computer and thus has no access to real space, but substitutes in the web, a spooky zero-gravity chaos dimension that will degrade and corrupt anyone who goes into it without suitable shielding, probably from all the pop-up ads and Twitter discourse. In short, when it comes to space as a horror setting, the idea that space itself is the enemy is a very popular concept for pretty self-evident reasons. Now, as a setting trope, space horror doesn't actually dictate much about the plot, but it does come with a set of standard plot hooks that can draw an unwitting protagonist into a real Really bad situation. Space horror protagonists will frequently be roped into the plot because something out in space went wrong and they've been called in to help or at least investigate to figure out what went wrong and how they can stop it from going wrong again in the future. Right. And when they get there, surprise! Turns out the thing that went wrong was one of about a million different horrible possibilities that are still very much present and threatening and their new goal is to survive and escape to avoid meeting the same fate as the first guys. Sometimes they're supposed to be on a rescue mission, but they don't need to bother. It literally never goes well. Best right. case scenario, the rescuee is already dead. Most suspicious scenario, the rescue QE seems oddly unscathed. Either way, it never works out. As a horror They mostly come out at night. Mostly. For a setting, space has one major advantage over its competitors. Scale. The biggest thing about space is that there's so much space in it. Threats can be planet-sized, empires can span galaxies, threats can have consumed whole worlds before reaching Earth. In contrast, most other horror stories are by necessity limited in scale, at least when it comes to the horror itself. A slasher film's horror is one guy, a monster movie's horror is one monster. Even a disaster movie generally focuses down on how a tiny core cast handles one environmental threat, often mm -hmm. in a purposefully claustrophobic environment to highlight how the goal is to escape. The threat might be a globe-spanning zombie plague, but the set piece will be a cramped hospital, a train, etc. The story relies on claustrophobia, because in order for the threat to be threatening, the heroes have to be trapped with it, and that in right. turn implies that the goal of the heroes is to escape. Space, on the other hand, has the ability to trap the character with open space. It's not that there's nowhere to run. There's a whole universe out there. It just won't help you. This actually applies even in alien horror that takes place that's actually probably the best line in this entire thing there's you can run anywhere you want to but there's no help out there for you on earth because the threat is usually something from the stars that threatens to make the earth uninhabitable and even if the threat is smaller scale the fact that a nightmare dropped out of the sky with no warning once means it could easily happen again yes. space becomes the world's biggest source of constant anxiety it's no longer a mysterious and inviting source of wanderlust encouraging us to explore a vast and beautiful universe and spread across the stars it's a cold airless radioactive void just waiting to drop body snatch and viruses and mutative alien parasites who swallow up our tiny starships and spit them out warped into something monstrous and unrecognizable and to make and don't even forget about the alien abduction scenarios don't forget about those at all watch fire in the sky at night with all the lights off i dare you i dare you matters worse, it's got us surrounded. It catches us staring up into the void and makes us flinch. Now, this is not quite unique to space, but non-space horror needs to do a bit of heavy lifting to produce the same feeling of being trapped by the very environment. Global disaster movies often do a very good job of convincing the audience that there is nowhere fully safe to run because the crisis is everywhere, but in most horror stories, running is still the ultimate goal. Even True. if the crisis is global, there's somewhere that's safer than here. An island, an aircraft carrier, a defensible military base, a facility researching a cure, there there needs to be something, because if the heroes have nowhere to run, the audience has nothing to root for. And sometimes that's the point. Maybe the heroes can't run, so they fight, or hide, or hole up and build the best life they can under the circumstances. Or maybe the story isn't actually about them surviving, but is instead about communicating some other goal, like emotional catharsis, or character development, or a message on the fundamental nature of humanity or society or something. But in space, there's never really anywhere to run, at least not on a practical time scale. Running is just categorically not on the table. In space horror, there are always two moments monsters. The actual monster and the cold, unfeeling void. Running from one will usually just let the other one eat you. Right. Instead, our heroes have to manage both threats, frequently with a convenient lets you and him fight by kicking the monster out of the airlock so it can deal with space instead. Yay. You know what they say, you don't need to outrun the freezing void of space, you just need to outrun the xenomorph you threw into the freezing void of space. Or something. So yeah. 
<laughs> okay. Horror has never been my genre. I've always been a good deal more hesitant about horror than anything else. Because of the sheer fact that horror tends to... It tends to annoy me more than anything else. It falls into ridiculous tropes a lot of the times. Like, one of my favorite horror movies of the past 20 years was Jeepers Creepers. And that was because no one knew about this monster. Like, why it was doing what it was... Well, they knew why it was doing what it was doing. The woman did, as a matter of fact. But there was no stopping it. There was no figuring it out. There was no negotiating with it. It was going to show up and bust you and leave. And I normally can't stand horror movie protagonists because they've done just about everything there is possible to do to jack themselves up into a situation that is just utterly nightmarish. But in Jeepers Creepers, they just did one thing wrong and this thing hunted them down. Um... And then they promptly ruined all that in Jeepers Creepers 2 when they threw every single trope they could at a wall at the speed of light and waited to see what would stick. It was so bad. Oh, look. The shy, beautiful teenage girl is going to fall asleep and have a dream where she figures out everything that's ever been known about this creature. Nobody listens to her until people start dropping. It was so unrelentingly stupid. And it didn't get any better. Warpugs, this was really good. I really enjoyed this. Um... The whole concept of space as a horror setting. There's... It's more of it like... She she mentioned the isolation, but I think it is the isolation that makes that horror... That, that, that horror setting feeling fit so much better. Because you very rarely have horror movies that work when you're talking about cities or stuff like that. You usually have to have that feeling of absolute isolation for it to work. My favorite kind of horror movies, though, are where there is no isolation. And it doesn't matter what you do. It's, this is, this is going to happen. This is, oh God, it's, it's a nightmare. Um, Warpugs, I'm going to shut up. Overly Sarcastic Productions, all their links are going to be in the description down below. I highly suggest you go check them out for more stuff like this. As far as I go, though, I'm going to head out from here. And I'll catch you guys next time. Check out the shirts. Links in the description below. I need something else that is likely to expand to come out because space isn't just the best horror movie setting for me. It's the best anything said.